Hello and welcome. Today we're going to cover a couple of big topics. We're going to be looking at female and male sexual anatomy and physiology. And again, you might be asking, why are we taking this in a psychology class? And this lecture is going to cover that and a whole lot more. So to begin with, though, let's actually just go ahead and ask that question. Why does this matter to psychology? Now, a sophomore year level psychology class is not going to go super deep into sensation and perception. Um, generally, in an introduction class, you'll get uh, introduced to the ideas about the eyes, you know, ears, the nose, feeling, taste, and then it starts to get into the physical structures that are in place, the biological anatomy that engage in these processes, and then also how we perceive stimuli. So again, when you're thinking about light and how we see, light hits the retina, which contains neurons. When light, specific light, that's attuned to that type of neuron, such as red, green, or blue light, stimulates that neuron. It releases neurotransmitters, sending signals to the next neuron, releasing transmitters uh, all the way up to your brain, okay? And so when you get to senior level psychology, that's when you're going to take sensation and perception and you have to go super deep into all of the physical processes in the brain that perceive stimuli, which means this, our brain is constantly sending signals or receiving signals and sending signals. It's very complex. <laughs> But let's say I touch my hand, okay? That sends a signal because it stimulates a neuron to release neurotransmitters, sending signals all along the nerves in my arm all the way up to my brain. And then my brain perceives what those signals means as, oh, I, someone or I just touched my own hand. And so again, if you hit yourself in the head, psh, you can kind of feel that a little bit. Well, why do you feel that? And it's because you stimulated neurons, nerves in your skin that then, re, you know, stimulated neurons, which cross the action potential, cross the threshold to release neurotransmitters, to stimulate the next neuron that, you know, excites the action potential. Then it crosses the threshold, releasing neurotransmitters. And you learn all about this, right? You have a, you have a, a neuron and then you have where it releases neurotransmitters and then you have dendrites of the next neuron that absorb those neurotransmitters and when the dendrites receive enough neurotransmitters it then you know targets the action potential to release and then you have the potassium sodium blend inside the cell and yada 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 i'm not going to nag you guys about this but again what's going on here when we're talking about sexual anatomy is the same thing in these areas that we label as erogenous zones, there are pockets of nerve endings. And in those nerve endings contain neurons. And when stimulated, the neurons send signals to our brain. And then our brain then interprets those signals. What is it experiencing? Okay, so why does this matter to psychology? Because what we're really asking is what parts of the brain are being utilized in these processes, okay? And so again, we can focus on things like neural networks. And so in order to give this lecture, I myself had to go deep into the nervous system, right? Because the nervous system is broken into two parts. You have your central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. Then you have your peripheral nervous system, which is all of these nerves running through our body. And then you can break down the peripheral nervous system into things like the endocrine system, which releases hormones into our blood and so on and so forth. But what's really happening is with sexual anatomy, our bodies are being stimulated in certain areas, which is releasing neurotransmitters, sending signals to your brain to tell you that you're being stimulated in certain areas. And then you then interpret that in such ways. And when it comes to sexual anatomy, our interpretation of neural signals can lead to things like orgasm or ejaculation or whatever it might be. But always remember that sexuality is dependent upon not just the stimuli going to our brain, but also our perception of that, both unconsciously and consciously. Because again, sexuality is both an unconscious and a, con un a conscious process. 
Your body, for example, when it wants sex, releases hormones into the bloodstream, sending signals to your brain, which then tells your brain, unconscious mind, I want sex. And then your unconscious mind will let your conscious mind know, hey, man, you might want sex. But it also works in different processes. You could be consciously looking at things or experiencing something that can be stimulating, which then excites your body, causing arousal after your brain is, you know, thinking about all this stuff. And then your brain is sending signals to your body. So again, the signals can go in two directions. They can go from your body to your central nervous system, but also from your central nervous system down to the peripheral nervous system. And so this lecture is all about giving you a quick introduction to the sexual anatomy associated with processes that can result in things like orgasm, ejaculation, pleasure, arousal, but then the other flip side of things like discomfort, not wanting to be touched there, things along those lines. And so I'm not going to go super deep into all of that. But we are going to talk about the actual anatomy because we need to know the physical structures associated with what stimulates neurons to release neurotransmitters and send it to our brain. Just like we need to understand how the eyes work, the physical parts of the eye, so that we understand how neurons are stimulating the eye, and then our brain perceives the stimulated neurons as a tree, for example. Because again, the argument is you don't really see the tree. Light hits your eye, which signals neurons to send neurotransmitters to your brain. And then your brain then interprets those neurotransmitters and then puts an image of your head of what it thinks it's seeing as the tree. And so the same thing goes on for sexual processes. When you stimulate certain parts of the body, that sends signals to the brain. And then your brain then perceives what it's experiencing. And then it can also go from the other direction our conscious mind is sending signals to our body like, hey, go ahead and get aroused, for example. And so again, you have all these different systems interacting. And so just to break down some of the parts of the brain associated with sexual processes. And again, this is just an introduction to sensation and perception. When you stimulate the body or when you think about things that are sexual in nature and thoughts in nature, for example, there are pro parts of the brain associated with that like light up, that gets stimulated, that processing information. And so you have it split into subcortical structures, which is again below that outer layer of our brain. And then you have the cortical structures, which is the outer layer of our brain. Remember, our brains developed in three phases. We have the hind brain. Uh, which is like breathing, heart rate, rate, things like that. That's the oldest part of the brain um, in the human evolution. Then we have the middle part of our brain, which is the limbic system, which contains things like the hypothalamus, uh, the amygdala, a lot of our emotion regulation, things along those lines occur in these areas. And then you have your outer cortex, which is the lobes of your brain, your temporal, your parietal, all of that. Uh, your so. The outer part of your brain evolved later in human evolution, and that's where our conscious mind really exists. That's our ability to do complex language, mathematics, art, communication with others, abstract thinking. All of that generally occurs in our cortical structures. So these subcortical structures associated with sexual stimuli and processing of emotions and other things that are along with this. You have the septal region in the limbic system, again, the middle of our brain. This is associated with mediating sexual behavior, pleasurable responses, and orgasms. Hypothalamus is associated with sexual drive, emotions, erection, ejaculation, sexual orientation. And I was studying some articles on this about what happens when you have damage to these brain parts of your brain, for example. And you will find that if you have damage to like the hypothalamus area or something that all of a sudden you lose your sex drive and it no longer exists. And these are some of the ways that we've kind of figured out what parts of the brain are lighting up or are associated with these processes. But remember, psychology is new. Neuroscience is new. We don't totally understand the brain or all of these processes that are happening, but we can see where things are happening with certain instruments. And then if you have brain damage, we can see the effects. Um, you have the ansa lenticularis and palladium. <laughs> That's associated with your libido and sexual drive. 
Now for the cortical structures, the lobes of our brain, the frontal lobe is associated with physical and motor sexual movements, arousal, control of sexual response. You have the parietal lobes that are associated with arousal and genital sen sensation. The temporal lobes are associated with sexual orientation, sexual disorders, and paraphilias, like sex, you know, which we'll talk about later. It's a dark, sad subject. And then we have the amygdala, which is again is associated with sexual drive. And I put over here on the right uh, something that I took from one of the articles. And it says here, the current evidence from lesion studies, again, problems with the brain, things along those lines, to date sex suggests that the initial phase sexual desire is mediated by subcortical structures, specifically the hypothalamus, ansa lenticularis, and palladium. The temporal lobe, specifically amygdala, play a role in this initial phase. I just, I read that whole article because I was just absolutely curious. Um, but again, the brain is associated with sexual desire, excitement, orgasm. It's not just a body process. So again, throughout this class, we always have to be thinking about the interplay between our mind and our body. Your body is talking to the brain. The brain is talking to the body. Again, you got your central and your peripheral nervous system working together to control all the processes of how humans function. All right, so now we'll start to delve deep into just these biological structures. For this exam, I don't need you to memorize every one of these. I just need you to realize the overall big picture that these areas of our body have big pockets of neurons. And when we stimulate these neurons, they send signals to our brain which can then be interpreted as things like positive, pleasurable, negative, unpleasurable, whatever it might be. Um, but we're going to go through the anatomy and then just realize that all these parts of the anatomy that we're talking about are connected to nerves which contain neurons. And when you stimulate these nerves through touch or pressure, uh, pulling, whatever it might be, this then sends signals to the brain, which you then interpret. And then these signals can create biological responses when our brain interprets it, releasing certain secretions. Your book has a lot of words like mucus, secretions. It's all up in this chapter. I'm gonna try to avoid too many of these. All right, so first and foremost, we have the vulva with the female anatomy. Again, why do we need to study this? Again, it's for understanding sexual well-being and also sexual intelligence, but then also how does this affect the brain and the way we think? How does the brain perceive it, etc.? So when we're talking about the vulva, we're talking about external genitals. This is commonly confused. The vagina is the internal. The vulva is the external. So vulva, all female external genital structures, including the hair, folds of the skin, urinary and vaginal openings. So again, this entire structure, everything that you see here is part of the vulva. Inside here is going to be where the vagina is, which is the next slide, or part of this also. Um, the vulva comes in an incredible diversity and shapes. Okay, so again, diversity and shapes. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into some of the psychological body image things and things along those lines. All right, so to begin with, you have your mons veneris. This is up top. This is the area covering the pubic bone. Sexually pleasurable. Why? Because there's numerous nerve endings. And then what's also fascinating is things like pubic hair, for example, holds scent that is creates sensory erotic pleasure. How is it that a scent can stimulate neurons in our nose, which creates sexual pleasure? But again, it's because we have like Tetris-like uh, neurons, right? And so when certain chemicals hit our nose and stimulate certain, it, it's like a lock and key. If the chemicals have the right shape to stimulate the neuron in our nose, that is responsible for sexuality or smelling, you know, the opposite sex or the same sex or pheromones or whatever it might be. We're all, that scent actually plays a huge role in our sexuality, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But again, it's incredible. There's a whole chapter on pheromones, so I don't want to like blow it now. But again, the idea that like 
scent plays a role. Why? It, again, it's because we have neurons that are just waiting for that smell in our noses. And once we smell the pheromones, it sends signals to our brain, which then sexually arouses us. And so again, pubic hair, for example, holds scent. And the book talks about later when it comes to grooming, what happens if you shave the pubic hair? Again, that's one of the things that could happen is it really, there's not as many pheromones present because there's no pubic hair there. And so it's incredible that things like scent is associated with erotic pleasure and why? And again, it's because neurons are like lock and key. The chemicals are the key. The neuron is the lock. When the chemicals interact with that lock and turn it, it sends signals to our brain. Also, pubic hair protects against friction and provides cushioning during intercourse. 84% of people were found to groom, but this varies with culture and age. But again, grooming for females is associated with an increased risk of inflammation, infection, skin abrasion, and ingrown hairs. So we should always consider things like how is culture associated with the way we you know, engage in things and what should be proper. All right, so then you have next the labia majora, which is the outer lips that is here. And the outer lips begin in the thigh, and they extend inward surrounding the labia minor, which is these inner lips and the urethral and vaginal openings, which is here, the urethral opening and the vaginal opening are here. And again, the labia, similar to the mons up here, have tons of nerve endings. So again, up here on top on the pubic bone, these lips here, the outer lips, the majora lips, then you have the menorah lips on the inside. All of these are just packed with nerve endings, okay? And when stimulated, send signals to the brain. And then, okay, and so the labia minora, again, here, these inner lips, they join with the, pre, the prepus, I don't, know if I, I don't know if I'm saying that word, P-R-E-P-U-C-E, -E. prepus, prepus, forgive me on that, I should have looked it up, that, again, is the clitoral hood, and males have the same thing here, which is called the foreskin for a male, so again, both women and male have this prepus, 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 however you pronounce it. And up here, again, there's extensive nerve endings, blood vessels, sweat glands, and oil glands. And again, these, the clitoral hood varies in size, shape, length, and color. But again, this whole area has just pockets of neurons, and when stimulated, sends signals to the brain. The book does, though, again, talk about genital alterations, such as piercing and jewelry. This also increased risks. It talks about cosmetic surgery. Again, remember earlier I said there's a lot of diversity of vulva colors and shapes. Again, lapioplasty is when you go in and you try to adjust the shape, for example, of the vulva or of the lips, whatever it might be. And so what is the evidence of that? And so there's some mixed research on that. So definitely that's something to look into. Your book also talks about female genital cutting or genital mutilation. I always talk about this in my sociology classes because I'm always asking, does it violate women's rights? But in some cultures, they believe that a woman is unclean and unmarriable unless they go through and they take not like a razor blade and they just start cutting off the labia. Okay, so here and here. Okay, but again, with males, they do circumcision. So is circumcision the same thing? And so again, is it genital cutting? Is it genital mutilation? Should we be ethnocentric and judge other cultures that engage in this? Or should we be cultural relativistic and respect that that's their culture? Again, these are just back and forth ethical discussions that you can have amongst yourselves. I just want to look at patterns in this class, not opinions. Um, the book does talk about the importance of things like genital self-exams. And again, a lot of us are ashamed and depending upon the culture and whether or not it's acceptable to talk about these things, a lot of us might not know how to label parts, for example. Like, you know, to find the clitoris, which is right here, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, you know, that's always like a myth, like, right? It's always a big joke you always hear about pop culture. Like, does anyone know where the clitoris is? But of course we do. It's right here. Oh, if you really want to find it, just find the clitoral hood. And then if you pull up on the clitoral hood a little bit, you'll expose the gland. And the gland is that tip of the clitoris. And that's all that we actually can see with the clitoris. The rest of it's underground, not underground, but underneath, which we'll talk about here in a second. And then gynecology is the medical specialty for female sexual and reproductive anatomy. All right, so 
the clitoris complex. So again, the clitoris, what we're seeing right here, that's the gland. That's the only real external part. And then if you kind of pull back the hood a little bit more, you can also see where there's like, you can kind of see the beginning of the shaft that starts to extend inward, but you can't actually physically see it. You can see the tip of it, like the gland, just like the head of a penis, you can see the gland, but you can't really see what's going on inside of it because you have the skin kind of protecting the shaft. And again, the same thing goes for females. So just below the mons where the inner lips converge and are covered by the clitoral hood. So again, here's the mons, here's the clitoral hood, there's your clitoris right there. It's very small, um, you know, the size of like, you know, like, I don't know, like a little bit bigger than a tip of a, a pencil, obviously. So I don't know how you, you know, two millimeters. <laughs> I should have got some measurements in here. Um, again, the, sh the shaft cannot be seen, but the shape can be seen. Um, the glands can be seen. That's the tip of the clitoris, again, underneath the clitoral hood if it's lifted and the labia minor is slightly parted. And again, the glands or the clitoris, especially the external visible part of the gland varies in size, shape, and position. It's sensitive and where most women experience orgasm. Again, there's two places to experience orgasm. Again, generally on the outside or on the inside, depending upon the type of orgasm. And then the clitoris, though, is part of a much larger system called the clitoral complex. And so deep underneath the mon, so underneath all of these areas, is just an entire root system. So imagine that the clitoris is a tree, and below the tree is all of the roots. And so these roots go deep into the vaginal canal, and then again, then have nerve endings connecting all different parts of the vaginal canal, and the outside, and then they all converge to send signals up to the brain. So the clitoral complex contains the clitoris, the internal crura, legs that project inward. So imagine my fist is the clitoris that's on the outside, and my two fingers here sticking down, that is the uh, internal crura. And then, you, so you again, you have these nerves going deep into the vaginal canal from the tip, which is like my fist going all the way down, okay? And so the internal crura, if I'm saying that right, these are, they, they call, the book says it's like legs that project inwards, and these surround the vagina. So from the clitoral hood, deep into the vag vaginal canal, imagine it's like a balloon, and then you're trying to connect pieces to all parts of the balloon. It's exactly like that. Okay, and so uh, the crura, urethral sponge, vestibular bulbs, and perineal sponge, all of which contain sexually reactive erectile tissues that enlarge when they fill with blood during arousal. So the entire vulva and the clitoral complex, just like in males when they get erections and blood flows in, same thing happens with females, okay? And then... Um, the interaction of the clitoris and the rest of the clitoral complex contribute to sexual arousal and orgasm. The clitoris is more sensitive to touch. Internal vagina may require more firm touch, such as internal pressure or stretching. And so again, you're going to find some disparities in the types of nerve endings and how much pressure or stimuli or types of stimuli stimulate what could be seen as pleasurable or even being able to feel it kind of experiences. Like your book talks about that many women, it's hard to like directly have that stimulation to the clitoris, but you can put a tampon inside your vagina and not even feel it's going in there. So why is there a difference? And again, it's all about the types of nerves that are there, how many nerve endings that are there, and how much pressure is required to stimulate that certain area. And so the book talks about the internal vagina may require more internal pressure, stretching, like pushing, pressure, stretching, pulling, things a little bit more like that. In the brain, again, in those areas that we talked about, we can see the orgasms happening. We can watch sexual arousal. We don't have sense enough, sensitive enough instruments to really see every single branch on the tree that's our brain and where it's all going, which we'll have to get to as we get smarter, as society and civilization grows, I guess. But currently, we can see the areas and pockets that are going off. So again, we know this is a body and brain process, okay? So the vestibule is rich in blood vessels and sensitive to touch. This contains the urinary and vaginal openings. 
So again, the vestibule in here, okay? And then the perineum is the area between the vaginal opening and the anus, contains spongy erectile tissue and nerve endings, and is also sensitive to the touch. And so down here also, we have some nerve endings that can be perceived as sexually pleasurable. And so the clitoral complex is what's considered an underlying structure along with the vagina. And then again, you have the vulva, which is your external genitalia. So the clitoral complex is underneath the labia and clitoris beneath the hood causes vulva to swell when stimulated. So again, when you're sexually aroused, it causes that external general genitalia to swell as the blood rushes in. The glands, that's the top of the clitoris, is connected to the shaft, which contains two small spongy structures called the cavernous bodies. And then also you have the Bartholin's gland on each side of the vaginal opening. So again, if you imagine this picture here, there, if inside here, inside your vagina, up in this area and up in this area, you also have glands that reduce that uh, that secrete things. Okay, so internal structures. You have the vagina, the cervix, the uterus, and the ovaries. Neural pathways lead from the clitoris, the walls of the vagina, the cervix, the perineum, again between the and the anus, to connect the main pelvic nerve going upward to the brain. So all of these areas are capable of, when stimulated, sending signals to the brain. And again, some people have more nerves than others. And this is why the book talks about sometimes it might be easier for some females to have orgasms than others. The G spot the, bo the book talks about is being the top wall of the vagina in the clitoral complex. So again, if you go back to the image, just up here inside, but just back here, if you put pressure there, it's about you know, a half of a finger length in there, that's where you're going to find the G spot. And again, when you have pressure put into that area or stimulation of some kind, you can get these sexual pleasurable results. And it says it's about one half to one third of the distance from the vaginal opening to the back of the vagina. But again, the G spot is not just one spot. It's an entire complex of dynamic interactions, you know, between the clitoris, urethra, top of the vaginal wall that causes arousal and orgasm. And I had to write a lot of this out because there's just a lot of parts um, involved. Uh, so vasocongestion, I mean, these some of these words, you know, can I even pull these out of my long-term memory? I would be incredible if I could. This is what happens. So again, the idea of the vulva swelling, for example, or the G-spot arousal, clitoral complex arousal, vasocongestion causes blood vessels to engorge with blood and fluid seeps from congested tissues to the inside of the vaginal walls, hence the idea of females getting wet. Uh, this facilitates entry and helps sperm travel and facilitates sensuousness and pleasure of touching. Again, why is it that you know, we, our bodies secrete all of these fluids, which that's basically what's going on. We have these glands that secrete fluids. We have the vaginal walls that secrete fluids. Um, why does this happen? Again, in the book says that it facilitates entry and helps sperm travel and facilitates sensuousness and pleasure of touching. The vagina chemistry varies throughout the month. The book talks about things like the negative effects of using douches and things like that. Again, it suggests that you should avoid it. The cervix is the back of the vagina. That's where sperm pass through. And the center is called the os or the os or however you want to pronounce os. And then in the uterus, you have the womb, the fallopian tubes. That's where the eggs pass down. The ovaries that has the eggs, uh, the endocrine crying gland, release sex hormones, initiate sexual development. There is just so much there from you know, again, I don't want to go super, super deep into all the anatomy. So I just kind of threw a little bit of this at the end of just, you know, to complete the big picture of the rest of the reproductive anatomy. Again, for this class, we're just focusing on these are the areas that when stimulated, send signals to the brain that your brain tends to interpret as sexually arousable or arousing or pleasurable or not pleasurable and uncomfortable or whatever it might be. Okay. The book also gets into things like menstruation. Um, and again, I don't know how relevant this is going to be for this class. It's not the biggest focus, but it's good to just discuss it because a little bit later we'll talk about things like how some of these physical processes do inflate or in affect, you know, the way you think and behave and things along those lines. But just a quick breakdown, menstruation is the sloughing off of uterine lining if conception has not occurred. Um, 
people's first menarche tends to be about 11 to 15. Again, menstruation, though, is regulated by brain processes. So why do we need to talk about this in psychology? This is like a biology thing, right? But again, it's the brain that is, you know, regulating all these processes. So menstruation is regulated by the hypothalamus and various endocrine glands, including a pituitary gland, adrenal gland, ovaries, and uterus. The hypothalamus monitors hormone levels in the bloodstreams. We have a whole chapter on hormones coming up. So I'm not going to weigh you down on this. But again, your endocrine system releases hormones. These glands, pituitary, adrenal, ovaries, they release hormones into our blood, which then travel to our brain. Our brains then interpret these signals, and then we come up with stuff to do with our body. It's complex. So again, the hypothalamus monitors hormone levels in the bloodstream, releasing chemicals that stimulate the pituitary to produce two hormones that affect the ovaries that stimulate the production of estrogen, FSH, and causes ova to mature into ovum. And so again, your brain and your body, your pituitary gland, your ovaries, they're all working together. Your brain, after it gets these hormones, then tells, you know, your glands to then mature an egg, which then passes down the fallopian tube, etc. And then during this time, around ovulation, as that egg is maturing and being sent down, women respond more to body scent changes, you know, women respond more sexually. And so we'll talk deeper into gender differences. I don't want to bog you down again today, but again... A woman's cycle isn't just a flat line like a man's. A man tends to be just kind of here, primed and ready, and a woman's is a little bit more like a bell curve or a circle or however you want to depict that graph. Um, but again, when women start to ovulating, you have biological responses and brain responses too. Because again, it's like the book says women become more flirty. But again, why? Is it because your body is releasing hormones into your uh, bloodstream, which traveled to your brain, which is telling your brain you want sex, and then, you know, your unconscious mind is telling your conscious mind you want sex, and then you become more flirty. It does happen like that. It's crazy. But again, like a woman's body scent changes, and males can pick up on this. Men can actually smell ovulation. Men can smell menstruation. Complex, right? But why can we send, why can a male smell menstruation or smell fertility or smell when a woman wants sex it's evolutionary psychology it's built into a male's body to pick up on the signal so that it knows okay sex is an option and you see this across the animal world okay your book also talks about psychological things like premenstrual syndrome again how much of this plays into things like sexuality is a good question but again, this is symptoms of physical discomfort and emotional irritability that occur 2 to 12 days before menstruation. Bloating, breast swelling, pain, fat layers become thicker, food cravings, um, high in fat, sugar and salt, negative self-image occurs, irritability, tension, depression, mood swings, feeling of lack of emotional control. How does, I mean, so again, if we look at sex differences in the body and how that affects the brain, that's part of a little bit larger of a conversation that, again, we need to have later because otherwise we'll never get through this one. But, you know, it's complex. It's a brain and body interacting kind of thing. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder, severe enough to disrupt functioning. Dysmenorrhea, pain before menstruation caused by overproduction of prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, hormones that induce uterine contractions. The book touches a little bit on menopause, cessation of menstruation resulting from aging or removal of ovaries, about 51 on average. It gets into hormone therapies, the pros and cons of estrogen, progesterone, and or testosterone. But again, these can reduce cancer, increase sexual enjoyment, prevent urinary tract infections, and have less bone loss and restores energy. Again, I don't know how relative that is for this class, so just a quick fly through to wrap up this section, but I just wanted to introduce it. And the same thing with the breast. You know, these are secondary characteristics. The breasts have nerve endings that when stimulated can be seen as sexually pleasurable, but again, we'll go into a little bit all of this a little bit deeper. Just to fly through it, male sexual anatomy and physiology. Again, male sexual and also oh, sorry, my bad. One second. Okay, so for male sexual anatomy, we have the penis, 
which consists of nerves, blood vessels, fibrous tissue, and three parallel cylinders of spongy tissue, as seen here. Okay. There are muscles present at the base of the penis for ejecting semen and urine. The shaft is the long portion. And then again, the head is called the glands. It is here on the head and along the skin, really the entire penis, the testes, the entire area. There are nerve endings here uh, in all of these areas. And then again, when stimulated, send signals to the brain that can be interpreted as pleasurable. Um, so the cylinders of the penis, they become engorged with blood during erection and may have a ridge on the underside of the penis. Um, so if you consider here the shaft of the penis, this is actually just covered in spongy layers. Your book has a really good job describing the three spongy layers that exist. But imagine a sponge. And so when a penis is not erect, it's just like a sponge that has no water in it. And then once you become sexually excited, then, then blood rushes in. And so imagine a sponge just filling with water and getting heavier and things along those lines. It's the same type of philosophy here. And then when the penis is no longer erect, then the blood leaves and so on and so forth. Okay. So the foreskin um, or the prepuce, same as the female hood, varies in area coverage of head. And often we circumcise these in the United States. But again, I think the book said it was around 60% of people that are circumcised. I have to look into it. I think I have it the next slide just to be more specific. But again, all of the penis is sensitive to touch and the glands. The head is the most sensitive. And the book does a good discussion of whether circumcision affects the sensitivity. And there's a little bit of a debate. But you could argue that um, circumcision does affect the sensitivity of the penis because the penis head or the gland becomes a little bit more tough because it's constantly being rubbed and so you could develop calluses and things along those lines. But there's some good debate on that. Uh, pleasure comes from focus on certain areas of diversity um, or other areas. So again, depending upon the individual, what they like and what the pleasure is can be very diverse. Some people like the entire penis simulated or different times, different places. Um, it's totally up in the air. Um, but again, the entire area can be sensitive and can be uh, create sensitivity enough to send signals to the brain. The scrotum is the outer layer here with thin skin that's slightly darker than the body color. Uh, the second layer is called the tunica dartos. It's the smooth muscle fibers and fibrous connective tissues inside the scrotum. Then you have the testes. And the testes, um, they're contained in scrotum hanging by what's called the spermatic cord. Okay, and the spermatic cord is the sperm carrying tube nerves and muscle fibers. Uh, the left um, testy may hang more than the right. Same thing with breasts. One may hang a little bit differently than the other. The book talks a little bit about what might happen if they fail to drop at birth. And so there's some kind of discussion about that, but not totally relevant for this class. But for this class, the testes secrete sex hormones into the bloodstream that travel to the brain. And again, we're going to get deep into this in chapter six. So I'm just kind of introducing you that these physical biological processes, they contain their own minds almost. <laughs> Again, so like our body is our endocrine system. It kind of knows what it wants and it releases, you know, information into our bloodstream, which travels to our brain to tell us what we want. And so again, how much of our sexuality is in our control? You know, our body and our unconscious mind are kicking us up into action a lot more than we want to discuss. But again, we'll get a little bit deeper into how these hormones function in chapter six. Um, the vas deferens or the duct tube, the sperm travels up, is inside the spermatic cord and connects to the ureter, which bypasses the bladder to exit through the ejaculatory duct into the prostate gland, which is also where the urethra passes through when leaving the bladder. All right, but again, it's all very complex because you have three different parts in here that are forming semen, right? So you have the vas deferens, you have the prostate gland, you have the seminal vesicles. All of these things are like creating different fluids and then all of the fluids mixed, okay? So the seminal vesicles are adjacent to the vas deferens and contribute to forming healthy semen and functional sperm. It contributes to 70% of the seminal fluid, including sugar to give sperm nutrition and mobility when needing to travel. Then you have the prostate gland, which releases 30% of secretions that form here, mixes with the sperm and seminal vesicle secretions to form seminal fluid. 
Then you have the Cowper's gland, which releases mucus-like substance, commonly known as precum, after arousal just before orgasm. And again, so you have all these various processes going on. I don't need you guys to memorize all of this stuff. What I need you to know is we have sexual anatomy. This is what it looks like. Again, we have the penis, we have the vulva, we have these internal structures, and you know all of which are then connected to nerve endings, which then send signals to the brain. That's some of the biggest things. Your book does talk about male sexual functions. Again, we'll get into some of this a little bit later, but just as a quick introduction, um, the uh, erection is coordinated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Sexual excitement sends a message that causes artery to expand in penis, allowing more blood to flow in, which swells erectile cylinders known as sponges. And again, thoughts and physical simulation interact in this process of sexual arousal and erection or the swelling of the blood into areas like the vulva or the penis. Okay, so again, it's we can think about it and we can feel it and all of these things work. Okay, the penis again stops being erect when messages from the nervous system stop and blood flow returns to normal. So again, why does an erection occur? And again, it's all about the signaling to the brain. If the signals are being sent to the brain, the erection continues. If the signals stop, it stops. It's just like a light switch. And, or just like electricity, that's exactly what our brain's like, like, right? If you send enough signals to our brain, we'll start to pay attention to it. If it's just a little bit, you don't even really notice it. Again, if you barely like hold your finger over your hand, you can hardly feel it. But then if you push really hard, you can feel it a lot. And so again, it's the same exact way when it comes to our sexual areas. When stimulated in certain ways, you know, with the right amount of pressure or whatever it might be, that then sends signals to our brain because, you know, action potentials fire, releasing neurotransmitters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of us can have orgasms with thoughts or physical alone or by themselves. You can have, you know, your body can have orgasms while you're sleeping and recreate, release secretions. You can have it when you're conscious and you're awake. You can just think about it and release it. It's very complex and cool. All right. Concerns about sexual functioning and health for males. Again, we're not going to go too deep into this today, but again, how does things like body image and culture influence our psychological well-being or our feelings about self-esteem and things along those lines? So do males have insecurities about penis size? That's a common complaint. Average is about 5.2 inches. However, that could be biased. The book has a whole discussion on whether, you know, how we actually collect data about penis size. Penile augmentation. Again, like we talked about with the, you know, the adjusting of the labia, for example, same thing with the penis. There's little research to support the success of lengthening or adjusting, and a lot of it suggests there's a lot of problems that come with it. Again, the good debate about circumcision versus genital mutilation. Is it a good thing to do? Is it genital mutilation? However, circumcision has been found to reduce health problems. Uh, including urinary tract infections, penile cancer awards, AIDS even. Um, and if you're not circumcised, it requires cleaning. Um, and But then again, that discussion of whether circumcision reduces sensitivity is a good one. And But again, um, re also circumcision associated with the reduction of penile cancer, testicular cancer, disease of the prostate is very complex. Um, so we'll have to talk about a lot of these things coming up. But again, I just wanted to give you guys a quick throw out, like just like sensation and perception. You have eyes, ears, a mouth, a nose. They're all capable of taking in stimuli and there's nerve endings, you know, attached to all of our senses, which send signals to the brain. Same thing. We have nerve endings attached to all of these sexually arousable areas of the body. And these aren't even all the erogenous zones. Again, you can talk about underneath the armpits, the backs of the knees, the shoulder blades. There are... The, the neck, there are so many other areas on the body, but again, today is just a focus on, you know, male and female sexual anatomy and physiology. This is a quick introduction, but again, I don't need you to be a master of this. It is important, but you can always look at a quick reference manual if you can't remember all the Latin words and all of that, because I know myself just teaching it. I had to go back, remember everything, check out the nervous system, look at how everything functions, 
break out all the parts of the nervous system, just to even give this lecture. I needed to go update my brain and make sure I was on top of my game to do it. Um, but again, we have parts of our body that are capable of sending signals to our brain. And our brain is capable of sending signals to parts of our body. And that all interacts into what we call sexuality or sexual functioning or how we, you know, whatever it might be. All right, y'all. Thank you so much and have a great day.